person that's about to take over the microphone. He pretty much grew up in this room. His parents forced him to do this since he was like six years old. Uh, he, he's on multiple banners as you look around the room here. He was last year's Houston Apartment Association president, probably be the NAA president in about five years or something like that. Uh, but John Boriak, come on up and let's talk about what he came for. Did, did I set the bar too high? You did fine. <laughs> All right, it's all there you yours. Go. Awesome, let me have this clicker. Man, thank you guys for coming out. This is awesome. I have not been here in uh, a while in, in, uh, in this room or at least in, in doing a case study, so this is really fun. Um, like you said, my name is John Boriak. I've actually been a member since 2007. That is 15 years ago. And uh, like you said, I kind of grew up in this room. This is a big part of, of my life. And I'm gonna show you tonight a path. There's many, many, many different paths you, you can take being a Lifestyles member, and a lot of people want to go this passive route or go this IRO route. I'm going to show you what it looks like to go in my kind of niche route that statistically not very many people will do, which is the lead investor route, and what's that, what that looks like on a 15-year track at the end of that. And just to kind of see the, the, the cool stuff that you get to be a part of, you can either do it firsthand by being a lead investor, or you can fuel it by being a passive investor or doing it on your own as an IRO. And um, I'm going to kind of take you through my story or through the last 15 years and then how I ended up kind of on this area over here, one of many different growth paths you can take uh, being a member of Lifestyle. So like I said, I joined in 2007 right after graduating high school. I had awesome parents who were very comfortable thinking outside the box. My dad's actually here tonight. And uh, when I graduated high school, they kind of gave me the option of like, hey, we've got some college money saved up and you can go to college and do that traditional route if you want. Or there are an alternative option is you can take this and use it as the seed money to start some kind of business with yet. We haven't even picked real estate, but some kind of business with. And I'm like, well, I don't especially love studying. This sounds like a lot more interesting and fun. Let's pursue that. And then through a friend of a friend found lifestyles, we're like, hmm, real estate has always sounded a little bit interesting. How do we do it smart? How do we do it right? How do we not make mistakes? I don't know. Enter lifestyles. And lifestyles provided the major um, guardrails to keep you from falling off the track this way or falling off the track that way. We realize, man, this is like 10 years of hard knocks education that we get to learn real quickly. You know, in that two day class is like drinking from a fire hydrant. You get to learn the guardrails on how to do this well and how to do this right. So I think the night of the two day class, we went home and started getting online and on hard. We found a, a single family house that night. We're like, ooh, I think this one fits the criteria. Let's send it to our broker at the time to see if this is gonna work. We actually ended up buying that house Sunday night of the two day class and then went on to buy seven more. So the first year I do a ride in, I was probably 19, doing a lot of single family rentals. This is you know, 2007, 2008, you could buy houses out of foreclosure for really cheap. And um, I got to get my hands dirty real quick. I was, I would, you know, they train you here, like Dave said, you should not be swinging hammers. Like that, if you're doing it, you're, you're not using your time well if you're doing that. But I was 19, I didn't know anything. I, I, was, I swung some hammers. I was you know, fixing some houses up. I was also learning how to get bids and how to negotiate contracts and how to rent properties. And that was a really good educational process for me. After a year of doing the single families, that's when we were like, I think this is going well. I wanna to go to the next level. Let's transition into the multifamily world. And so we flipped into a 50 unit apartment complex in a not so great area of a town. And I got to then learn the business really on the front lines, you know, running, uh, running, being very much in the business, which you're, again, you're not supposed to do necessarily. You're supposed to work on the business, not in the business. But I was 20. I needed to learn the business. I was very much in the business, very hands-on, running that 50-unit deal. And I learned multifamily vendor contacts and how, to, what, how this, is, this is different from single family, how you grow a property's value, how you operate during a recession, all these valuable lessons. And then after four years, oh, that whole time also, I'm running the 50 unit, but I'm also coming to every educational offering um, at Lifestyles. Every, at the time they did a lot of Wednesday night classes, I was hitting up every road trip and I'm realizing, hey, there's a few key people in this room who are farther down the road than I am. And you know, I gotta tell you, running a 50 unit in, day, in and out every day is not like just loads of fun, you know, but I could see the, the light at the end of the tunnel or where the path was leading because of the Scott Tenney's and the Curtis Haynes and the Ira Grosses of the world who I've got to sit next to in this room. We'd go to lunch on a road trip and I'd be like, 
the kid at the high school cafeteria, get your plate, and like, ooh, who do I, who, where's the cool kids I can go sit next to? I want to go sit to that guy. And I'd kind of, you know, nudge, nudge in between Scott just because I wanted to overhear the conversation. Me, I may not even be smart enough to ask him a question, but I just want to absorb what this energy and what he's, what he's thinking and how they're thinking through things. So everything I picked up, they would say something like, oh, yeah, I found a vendor for supplying this. Well, then I got to go call that vendor and use it at my 50 unit, right? I had something like a playground to go play on as I was learning all the things that lifestyles taught. So then four years later, finally convinced enough people to give me enough money to invent, become a lead investor on a 200-unit property in 2012. And um, that deal has been awesome. And I've, then I realized, like, okay, this is fun. When you get in there and you're, you have a little bit bigger business, you've got some staff, there's a layer between me and the residents, I get to renovate something and turn it into something awesome. You can really, um, that, that took the business to a next level of maturity. I was like, this is awesome. I want to do this again. And so I did. And I've done it again and again and again for um, acquiring a deal about every two years. That's kind of my heartbeat is I like to buy a deal rehab it, get it humming, put a bow on it, and then go looking for the next one. I'm not trying to buy a deal every three months. Um, and that, that's not how you have to do it. That's not how everybody does it. In fact, most people don't. I'm slower and pickier than most. Um, and so I, I, my heartbeat has been buying a deal about every two years. I've bought yield plays. I've bought value plays. I've bought everything in between, all in Houston, it's because I also self-manage it or have a management company. But we're up now to six properties kind of all over Houston, a total of uh, 1,522 units, which I'm very, very proud of. Thank you. And then, like I said, I own the, I'm formed a management company very, very early on, and my management company runs the operations of the six properties, right? So I self-manage what's called owner-operators. We own the properties, and we operate them. So I have a management company with 45-ish employees that runs you know, the, the six properties. And then, um, and then I've also, as I got... Uh, more involved in our industry, and I started meeting new people, I realized that we have an incredible industry association for apartments in Houston called the Houston Apartment Association. Um, it's actually the largest apartment association in the country. And uh, in that world, in that group, you have people um, who work for just third-party management companies, people who work for suppliers. There's some owners in there. There's some, you know, some other managers in there. And um, I got to in that group, I started getting plugged in, going to classes, and I realized there are some VPs and executives of people, of companies that are running 20, 50, 100,000 units. I mean, big, big, big professional companies that are, that are involved in this, in this apartment association. And if I can volunteer to be on a committee with the VP of Graystar running 100,000 units, I might be able to learn something from that guy. This is a pretty good use of my time. So I got to put more and more involved in there, met some incredible people, very smart people through HAA, and I eventually served as president of the Houston Apartment Association last year in 2021, which was it just exposed me to a whole other level of, um, the, the, of this industry that not everybody needs to get involved with, but it really helped me personally develop. So... Um, in this 15 years, my 15-year journey lifestyles, I learned a few things, and I'm going to kind of recap here tonight some kind of best practices that most of you probably will not use firsthand. This is really niche for lead investors or people that own and run companies, uh, but it's really good to know. And more than anything, I want you to see how the platform that Lifestyles teaches can allow you to do so many different things. And here's one route that it provides, and my, my route that I took, some things that I've learned. First off, you saw Dell went through the what you call the maturity continuum, where it's, you know, from you know dependent on your job to independent. I'm a business owner by golly. To I know I'm interdependent with everybody else, and I'm going to kind of add one more next step to that on the, as a lead investor that I'll walk through. So you know, first off, this is the journey of a lead investor. I want to call it the progression of a lead investor, which again is just one of many routes that you can take as a member of Lifestyles. But if you choose this route, here's kind of the the progression that you normally go through. First. First off, you're a lead investor and you get your first deal. You bought 30 units in this part of town or whatever, and um, this is your baby. Because now you're self-employed. Congratulations, you just got a job. You're there. You're working long hours probably. You're, it's, it's do or die. Everything's on the line. And you're, you, know, you want to make this deal. It's your first one. You want to make it successful. Um, you want to make some money. The budget's tight. You're, you're watching every bill that goes in. You're, you're saving $20 here and saving $20 there, making sure this deal um, is successful. Wearing a lot of hats. You can go from doing the books to scrubbing some floors to hiring somebody to protesting taxes to buying 
getting an insurance policy. Like you got to wear a lot of hats. It's a lot of working in the business, um, probably more so than on the business. It's a, it's a path you have to go through. And mostly lifestyles holds your hand the whole way. I mean, I wore out the operations consultants here. Those first four years I had this deal. I was calling these poor women on like Christmas Eve. Like, Hey, I've got this resident. What do I do this? They're like, John, it's Christmas. You can wait till Monday. I'm like, okay, got it. Um, and then not only the people on staff, but the other members, I mean, I, every day I'm calling somebody is like, I don't know how to, I found bees. What do I do with bees? And I'm like, don't worry. Here's the number. Call this person, do this thing. It's like, oh, perfect. There's something else. I learned that, you know, those kinds of things all the time just felt so, um, sh um, help. There's so much, so much help. So many people willing to help along the way. Okay, so then you go from self-employed, you buy a second deal, maybe you get into your third deal, and now you've got some staff, you've got some capacity, you've got some, some a layer between you and the residents, you've got maintenance people, and you've got some managers, you've got several deals, and now you maybe don't have to put in those super long, hard hours when the office is open. You have a little more flexibility in your schedule. This is kind of nice. You find, hey, I'm leading a team of people. I'm not wearing all the hats because I'm not a very good maintenance guy. There's guys out there that are a lot better at this than I am. Let me let them do that job. And you find yourself, hey, I get to work more on the business than in the day-to-day -day stuff. I could be thinking, what technology solutions do we need to implement? How do I make my team members feel you know, rewarded and part of the, the family? And then you do that, another deal or two, you're making a little money, you get to buy some more properties. And then I'm, this is the final step that I talked about, that kind of that fourth phase that I've really uh, found myself enjoying these last deal or two. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to coin the uh, coin, I'm going to dub it impact maker. And it goes from, I don't do the next deal to make another chunk of money. I don't do the deal to just say like, ooh, look at me. I went from this many units to that many units. I realize I'm now in a position where I have an incredible amount of influence on a lot of people. They being, I got 45 employees. I'm responsible for their jobs and I can make their jobs really hard and take advantage of them or I can make it a really life-giving, um, secure place where they can provide for their family and enjoy going to work and feel like what they're doing makes a difference. I house 1,522 families at my apartments. 1,522 families. This is places where there's people, they're living their lives here, they're raising babies here, they're having Christmas here, they're family dinners, ups and downs. This is a huge cornerstone of 1,522 families' lives that can either be a place where they don't know if the roof's going to leak. They don't know if they can safely walk to their car. Is it okay to let their kids play outside? I can, you, when you're able to provide a clean, safe, functional, nurturing home for people to live in, man, what an impact you get to make on so many people who live here who are, don't have to worry about those things as much. And have, when you can provide that cornerstone, that housing stability, it improves everything up the scale from um, how well kids do in school, um, how healthy families are. I mean, the, the ability to positively impact people's lives is tremendous. And so um, I'm going to talk for a second about, we'll, we'll get to how to impact residents in a second. Um, leading a team is one of the most fulfilling things I do. And I would say it's one of the strategic kind of advantages that I have at, with my company. My company is called Veritas Equity Management. And I love um, our, our team and our culture we've created there trickles down into every aspect of the business and how the properties run. And I've, I'm going to just briefly touch on how, how is this done? Okay, this sounds great. This is real hypothetical. What's the meaty piece of like, how do you do this? How do you get 45 people working in a company who love what they do, are engaged and stay motivated and don't, you know, um, you know or, or, or feel like they're on your team and they're part of the team. It's not just like I give you X and you give me Y relationship. It's they're, they're on board. And I stole this from Patrick Lencioni. He has an awesome book. I think it's called Three Signs of a Miserable Job. And it's kind of a reverse psychology uh, title. But there's three things that I really focus on with any job. And if you lead any team of people or any person at all, I would, I would uh, like to suggest that this is an awesome framework to, to give you to how do I make people um, enjoy coming to work, enjoy their job, and make that be a real key piece of their life. The first thing is people need to know if they're doing a good job or not. And that comes from having objective scorecard metrics. These are numbers that they can point to and say, man, I had a good month or I didn't. I worked really hard compared to this person and I won or I didn't. And this is not, I think you did a good job. This is like, 
you brought in X amount of revenue and, and everybody in the company has their numbers. The manager, maybe their numbers are the occupancy of a property and the expenses per door and the renewal ratio, whatever it is, you pick your numbers and like you're, we're tracking these numbers, we're reporting these numbers, they know it, I know it, it's on a scorecard, it's all repeated. And then they can know, then they have the autonomy and the authority to control those numbers. I tell them, get the occupancy up. But I don't go in there and be like, and you need to call this person and advertise here, and here's your screen. Like, I let them do their job. These are professionals at this level that know what they're doing. I don't have to sit there and train every little thing when they know what they're doing. And so they have the autonomy, the authority, and they get rewarded when they win. We have numbers to track. When you do well, you add value to the property, you get rewarded. That can be money reward. That can be um, flexibility rewards. There's lots of ways to do that. But when the, when the tree grows, everybody gets to enjoy the fruit. So everybody needs to have objective scorecard metrics that they're measured by. Second thing, it is important that everybody is known and cared for by their leaders. If you are just showing up and you feel like you're a, a piece in the wheel of a machine, that's going to burn out. And at some point, you're going to find somebody who will pay you an extra dollar to come work over there and be in their machine instead of this machine. That does, we got to keep, the, the whole thing is this recipe for team member retention. How do you keep people in? And that's being known and cared for by their leaders. We spend a lot of time, money. Hell, I have full-time employees whose jobs is making people feel known and cared for. We do monthly team events. We get everybody in the company in the same room to celebrate the birthdays that month. Or we do family events. Hey, I'll rent out a movie theater. Everybody come, bring your families, bring your mom and your dad, come to the movies. We're going to rent out the whole theater. We do um, uh, all kinds of fun family events, picnics, and we'll hire, I don't know, DJs, Christmas parties, a huge blood, and I get to know the families and their spouses and their kids, and the fact that I can remember a spouse's name means a lot to a team member who's been there several years, and then we focus a lot, I talk about it all the time, our priorities in this company are God first, family second, and work comes third. Fam work should never take precedence over a family crisis or something to do with your faith. So we're never open on Sundays. We encourage people to volunteer. We, in fact, after you work for the company for a year, you get an extra week of paid time off if you spend that week volunteering for a nonprofit of some kind. We, uh, we discourage working late. If I hear about a manager who's routinely staying to 6, 7 o'clock, I'll call her or my, or my staff will and be like, you need to go home to your kids. It can wait. We'll figure, you need some more help. We need something else. We're not like rewarding this. Ooh, you put in 80 hours. That's great. We discourage that because that leads to burnout. That's a short-term win for a long-term pain or long-term suffering. Um, paternity leave. We have reduced summer hours so people can spend more time with their kids. If you're on the corporate level, unlimited PTO. If you get your job done, I don't care when, where, why, or how. We don't have a corporate office. You have a responsibility that you have to get done. Um, and so if you get it done at home or at a coffee shop or at the property, I'm not going to hold your hand and have all these rules about how you get it done and when you get it done. You just get the work done. I don't care when, where, why, or how. Last thing, and we're going to move on. It is important for people to know that they have the ability through their work to positively impact the lives of others. You could have awesome scorecard metrics, and you could feel known and cared for by your leaders, but if you're running a Ponzi scheme that's taking advantage of people, nobody's going to be fulfilled by that for the long haul. That's not a healthy long-term organization. So they have to know me showing, to work, showing up to work every day is having a positive impact on others, on residents, by providing that healthy home I talked about, on investors. We talk all the time. Our investors are not some big, huge fund that you don't see. We'll bring investors out to the property, meet these people, shake y'all's hands, and they're like, wow, that person seemed really down to earth. I'm like, yeah, because that's a normal person <laughs> to join lifestyles. And, um, and we emphasize, like, hey, you're not just providing a door. You don't have a, these people aren't unit numbers. These are homes for people. And so then we go the next step and we really focus on how do we, yes, provide a clean, safe, functional home, but if we have 1,522 families living in our apartments, many, many of them have kids, and these, what an opportunity to have an incredible impact in these kids' lives living in our communities um, with, for not a lot of extra money. I mean, really cool things we can do. So right now, we have several properties with after-school kids programs where the kids get dropped off on the bus, and they can, instead of going home and playing video games or whatever their unit, hey, come to the after-school kids program. We'll have games. We'll have crafts. We'll teach you Bible lessons, whatever it is. We have snacks, summer lunch. We're on sports camps during the summer. We do back-to-school supply drives. We'll have, we have tutors come in and do homework help for after-school homework help. We do swim lessons during the summer. We bring in churches to do events all summer long, all year long, kids' crafts, all these awesome things to keep the kids engaged. 
And in fact, this year, I'm really excited. We just hired an outreach director, as we're calling her, and um, she is super well connected, and she's going to start bringing to our properties things for adults, too, GED classes if they never graduated high school, ESL training if, if English is not their first language, you know, fitness training, personal finance training, telehealth providers. If they got, you know, something going on with their health, they maybe don't want to go to the doctor or they can't afford to go to the doctor, they don't have insurance, hey, we'll bring, we'll bring that option on site. Learning how to basic computer skills, how to send an email. You need an email account. You need to open this account. Here's what a PDF is. And um, so, so I'm really excited to start bringing these services to our properties as well. And I'm, I'm not trying to, um, I know this is like super university level, like advanced stuff. Not many of you are gonna necessarily have the power to go do this, but I want to, I'm giving you this as an example. This is the kind of incredible impact that you are able to make by being a part of this Lifestyles family and in being investors in these properties. And that we do, this is the level of care that many, many Lifestyles members have for their residents and for their properties, it feeds into that. And you are the, the engine, you're the jet fuel pushing the rocket forward. And it works, man. This is, we talked a little bit about our awards and stuff. This is um, some results that uh, we've been recognized for from different apartment associations and other organizations. We have five of our six properties have won the Houston, thank you, have won the Houston Property of the Year, best property in the city. Uh, so five of our six, and we'll get number, just because number six, we're, which we're gonna talk about tonight, we've only owned a year. We have still getting that one all fixed up. Um, we have three times won the National Property of the Year, so the best property in the nation. We've won Houston State and National Owner of the Year. We have three times won the National Apartment Association's Best Companies to Work For. We have had 15 individuals, either myself or our staff, win an individual award. So that's either Owner of the, owner of the Year, Manager of the Year, Maintenance Tech of the Year. We have thousands and thousands of apartment employees in Houston, and my team of 45, we've won 15 of those awards and then we've gotten we've won three individual state awards for like the best manager in the state the best leasing consultant in the state the best maintenance tech in the state 32 total apartment association awards and then outside of the apartment industry specifically just in this, just business in general we've won houston's best and brightest companies to work for seven years in a row best places to work in multifamily in 2021 and best management company for tomball three years in a row so my point being this is an incredible um a bit, the organization that can fuel years and years of winners and awards and impact in many, many, many different people's lives. <clears throat> I'm gonna get a drink of water because I'm talking fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I moved. I moved quickly. It's past my bedtime. We gotta get to moving. <laughs> so, a natural thing to think is okay, all this sounds good, sounds fun. But surely if you're doing all this extra stuff, it's at the sacrifice of making money. Like if you're bringing in all these extra classes and training and crafts and school programs, uh, that's got to sacrifice some profits. We're not, are we running a for-profit or non-profit business here? So now let's talk about the actual case study property. Enter Linda Vista Apartments, which was called Vista del Sol. This is an old picture. And this property I purchased, you know, there's a... There's a lot of properties you see were bought, you know, two, three, four years ago. I bought this property almost exactly one year ago. This was purchased in August, August of 2021. 264 units built a long time ago in 1963. And uh, not a ton of work had been done to it since 1963. So, which is reflected in the purchase price. I bought this property for $15.5 million. That's a little shy of $59,000 a unit, um, which, I'm, which is a good deal. It needed some work. Um, so we had $700,000 of closing costs, which is high, um, but with this was an, a loan assumption. So there was, a, there was a loan in place, and part of the deal, part of the reason I got it for such a good price is I agreed to assume the seller's existing loan so he didn't have to pay a couple million dollars in prepayment penalties on his loan. Loan assumptions are a pain, and they take a long time, hence the high closing cost number. But all in all, I raised $7 million to buy this deal, so we have $7 million cash out of pocket. The loan that I assumed was $10,800,000, and my rehab budget is $1,600,000. I didn't do the math on what that is per unit, but I think it's north of 10. I'm not sure. Somebody smarter than me can tell me. But yeah, we had $1,600,000 in rehab to do with this property. So, awesome. Yeah, so now I get to add something. He's been going along pretty well, hasn't he? <laughs> uh, so, so some of the things he, he was just talking about um, hit me, and that is the loan assumption. 
is kind of a unique thing that goes on in here. Most everything you buy, you put a new loan on it, it's pretty straightforward. However, there are certain times, and he's been around here since 2007, I've been around since 2006, we've been through one financial crisis, who knows we may have another one in our future, but in certain times, these loan assumption things become very, very nice triggers. That price per door can only happen under a loan assumption because you've saved somebody else prepayment penalties on their loan. So those are the types of things that we'll try and talk you through. In fact, I was just exchanging emails today, and I'll be meeting with somebody tomorrow where they're looking at a deal where there's a loan assumption option, and it's probably going to work out after we do all the math to be the way for them to go. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, if I was to go buy this as a market deal and put a new loan on it, the price would have been much higher because the seller was going to incur, I can't remember the exact number, but a million or two in prepayment penalties. And so that wasn't going to work out. Cool. Okay, here's some numbers. Re this really is quick, really quick. Oh, okay. Go back to that slide. I thought Scott was going to bring this up. <laughs> okay. $7 million. How many people in this room have $7 million? Well, a couple of us, but most of us don't. I do not. So... When you're new and you're listening for the first time, you go, yeah, that's a bunch of millionaires. What about regular folks like me? Just so you know, were all your investors here in Houston worth it from all over America? All over the state. I think, I'm not sure we had too many outside of Texas, but for sure out of the state, I do have outside the state investors in other deals. In other deals. So, and, and that's what I want to bring up for the people that are watching nationwide. You could be in Hawaii. You could be in Kansas. It doesn't matter where you live. Live where you want to live. Invest where it makes sense. So the point of it is, is this, is, you can have 50 people, 100 different people in this from all across America, all different walks of life. But in these deals, we have people invest as little as 25K, 50K, 100K, 200K. I just want you to know that real people, real results, put money in this deal. Okay, so I want to make sure people know you don't have to have $7 million to do this. You might have put 50000 in, and we'll talk more about returns in a minute, okay? Yeah, the investors in these things, like I said, it's not some real sophisticated New York fund. It's normal people. I laugh all the time because every year we, you know, we do our tax returns and we send out the K-1s that show how much money you lost because of depreciation on paper. And we'll, so we'll blast these K-1s out, and I get people all the time call me like, hey, um, I know your K-1, and my K-1 is in like your investor portal, and I could probably go figure that out. I just don't want to. Like, can you just email it to me <laughs> or can I come pick it up? I'm just like, yes, we'll figure it out. <laughs> Let's make it happen. You know, I don't know that you should actually have said what you just said. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> edit, edit. For a couple of reasons. One of which I want to make sure they understand is you didn't actually lose money. All right. He, he's saying you lost money. No, you didn't. You had jumped a ahead in the class for loss after depreciation. There are people in this room that are here for the first time going, I don't know what the hell I'm doing here, man. They're losing money. Big boys. even talk. <laughs> No, so, we're making money. And I'll show you that in a second. They better and I'm going to ask you to mail mine next year. <laughs> But we don't want to pay taxes on it, so we record depreciation expenses to show on paper we did not make any money, so we don't pay any taxes. Don't worry. I know that was a lot of gobbledygook you heard right there for new. I will break down step by step this weekend why we pay no tax on real estate if done correctly, which is what John's doing. It will all make sense. Okay, this is the day one numbers. This is the numbers I was looking at upon takeover. Remember, this was a value add deal. This was a distress deal. This deal needed some help. It didn't make sense on day one. And I'll show you why it did why it does make sense in the end. You know, the, the net operating income going into this thing was five hundred and seven thousand dollars a year, so about half a million dollars a year. The mortgage was seven hundred. So on paper, this deal looked like it should be losing money out the gate. But Look at this, low-hanging fruit, or economic vacancy. That's a super technical term that I'm going to break down. Um, it was 27%. So if this economic vacancy, a very simple way to put it, if a property had was fully leased, fully occupied, and everybody paid rent on the first, you would have zero economic vacancy. Okay? So it's like in the perfect Disney world, you would make this, you collect this, Whatever that difference is off of that percentage-wise, that's your economic vacancy number. So the seller on this thing was only collecting about 70% of what he should have been collecting. So there's some, you see the opportunity there, right? There's some meat on the bone just by running it better. Um, the rents that were at least 10% below market, probably more, there was zero internet presence. This is a multi-million dollar company without a website. 
I'm not even sure you could find it on, on like Google. And lots and lots and lots of deferred maintenance. There we had roof leaks, there was lots of flooding, potholes in the parking lot, the pool was closed, lots of room for improvement. What he's talking about here, this is what we really look Perfect. for. I started this drooling. Is, I mean, my first place, potholes that would swallow a Volkswagen. This poorly run, poorly managed, poorly owned, everything, low-hanging fruit, he said. I agree. Um, this is what you're looking for where you can get a home run. And not only make a home run, make a lot of money, but there's 264 families living here with roof, roofs leaking, potholes in there, can't, get, can't drive down the driveway without popping their tires, um, you know, flooding. What an opportunity to come improve the living conditions for 264 families in Pasadena, Texas. Here's some before and after pictures. So remember, we did a million six in rehab over the course of, the, of about a year. This was the entrance to the office beforehand. There's like jail bars on the main office door. The door is offset to the side. You can't see inside. There's some funky Aztec situation on the sides going as you walk up. It's like, we, this is the first impression, right? This is the first date. Like, we, we got to fix this. And so on the right side, this is stepped back. And so I, it's kind of dark in there. You can't see an exact comparison, but we built a nice inviting pergola over the side, new landscaping, blew out the walls and put in inviting doors that were full light. Now this is a better first impression. This is a much better, hello, how are you on the first date? Uh, well, even back it up from there, the signs, you can tell the difference. On the left side, th this sign is literally broken. Like there's a hole in it. Like somebody threw a baseball through it and, uh, and interesting color choices. And so we gave it a fresher look, new signage. The pool, like I said, was closed. That's a very generous pic before picture of the pool. Uh, the weather was nice that day. There was zero furniture around it, zero uh, landscaping around it. I, don't, I didn't have time to get out there and take an awesome after picture, but we added this outdoor kitchen, added landscaping around the fencing. The roofs, like I said, leaked every time it rained, and the ACs worked maybe. It's in Houston. This is Houston. You need a working AC. We replaced 120 AC units and did 100% new roofs all over the property to stop the leaks. Uh, interiors, we didn't do as much. We are refocused on clean, safe, functional, right? We're not, this is, this is not an area of town where we're going to get a massive return on an investment of granite or, you know, fancy smart locks or something like that. But we did, we changed the color scheme. We started, we used kind of some mix on the, uh, some black appliances in there, but didn't change a ton. The, some, more of this, just bringing everything up to a uniform standard. It was kind of Frankenstein before. And then these are not, neither of these are before pictures. I'm just showing you after. So on the left is our leasing office. If the front, if the front sign is the first date, the entrance to the leasing office is the second date, the interior is the third date. And so we really wanted to fix that up nice. It was, it was um, very foreboding, very thrown together before. We fixed it up very nice. And on the right side I love is we utilized an existing building to make our after school kids club room. And you can see it's decorated with, we got all kind of arts and crafts and um, after a TV, after school activities that happen in there all the time. Okay, now we get to the fun stuff. We got numbers. So uh, remember, we've been in this deal a year. This deal is a year old. And so I've got on here our year one numbers. This is as of like a month ago or last, our last time we had financials and I annualized them, which means I multiplied them times 12. I took our you know, most recent set of financials for the month of, I think it was July, I can't remember. Multiplied it times 12, that's the year one numbers. The year two and three are projected numbers based on how we've grown so far. Now I will tell you, we're, we've picked up a lot of traction after this rehab is finished, right? We get in, we fix the leaks, we paint it, we're, we're uh, making it a much, much nicer, better curvy place to live. I think we should catch a lot more traction going into year two and three than the pace we've been on to get to year one. But to be conservative, I just kept the year one um, progress and extended it through year three. So you can see what that would look like. So in year one, remember, uh, we were losing, the NOI, we were losing, like we're losing money on day one, right? Negative $200,000. Well, our income and rents in year one is 2.6 million. Our operating expenses annualized about a million and a half, which means our NOI, which was, remember, $507,000, was half a million dollars, the net operating income. By the way, net NOI, I've been using that jargon, I'm sorry. Net operating income is your income minus your operating expenses, net operating income. So that's before you pay your mortgage um, to give you true like cash flow, but that's your net operating income. That's the, the business is crank, cranking out this much money. Went from half a million dollars to $1.1 million. 
Our mortgage didn't change, because it's not like your mortgage doesn't go up when you make more money. The mortgage is fixed. The mortgage is still 700000 That means our cash flow, our net cash flow, which was negative almost 200000 when we took over, is now positive $400,000, which is a, equates to an annualized return on that initial $7 million investment just from the cash flow of almost 6%, 5.7%. So we've got a $600,000 a year turnaround in 12 months? 12 months. $600,000 year turnaround, 12 months. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so basic back of the napkin math, moving through year three, the deal should get to where it's cranking up, you know, eight and a half percent or so by year three. This is great. I would buy the deal tomorrow again just to get a six, seven, eight percent return. But there's more. So remember, day one, $507,000, a property value, what I paid for it was a five and a half cap rate, $15.5 million. At the end of year one, so a year, 12 months into the deal, our NOI, remember, went from half a million to 1.1. Divide that by a five and a half cap rate, which this is super advanced stuff that you're gonna, you'll learn in the two day, don't worry about it. It's just an equation we use to generate a rough guess on a property value. This property value in one year, went from $15.5 million to $20 million. In a theoretical world, if we decided we could sell today and you know, try to do the math to figure out how much equity we've captured, we, we would have to pay off our, our loan of 10 and a half, right? That's the loan member we assumed. We've paid it down a little bit because this is there's no interest only on this loan. We're actually paying principal right now. We, if we paid off the loan, we returned the initial capital of $7 million back to the investors. We've made $400,000. Remember, we're, made, we're cranking out $400,000 a year in year one. That means we've captured $2.8 million in 12 months, made almost $3 million in 12 months. But do that math. Look how that exponentially grows into year three. If we just continue this pace for another couple of years, in year three, get, to the, get down to the bottom, we will have made 100% return in three years on that original investment on this deal. Give me a hand. And really, really quick, I, I want to touch on that for a second because remember, I said you can invest whatever amount you want to deal 50K, 100K, half million, it doesn't matter what it is. Now, look at this one deal. Three years later, you doubled your money, 100% return. Look at what you're doing right now your 401K, your IRA, your TSP, your 403B. 30 years you worked up to save up that 100 or 200 grand. If you put in this deal and you double in three years, would that not be quicker? Do you see why we love real estate? Give this man a hand for doing that for his investors. And then like Dell talked about with the abundance mentality, I don't win because someone else lost. I don't win because I took advantage of the investors. I don't win because I took advantage of the residents. And the, when done the right way, everybody should win. Residents, like I mentioned, were living in a home where they maybe couldn't feel safe with their kids going outside. The roof was going to leak. Their unit might flood. They now have 264 safe functional, nurturing homes that their kids have after scare, after school programming they can go to. We have back to school drive events. There's a fun playground there, much better home for them to live in. So let me just build on this and I'm gonna tie it back to where you started before we ever got into the property. And that is, this reminds me a lot of my first deal. It was 262 units, about the same size, about the same condition when I took it over. And we started upgrading all these units and you know, for better or worse, we started raising the rents associated with the upgrades that we did. The surprise to me was the people that had lived through the problems that they endured before were paying over $100. And this was when the rents when we were taking over were like 485 15 years ago, and we were raising them to 585 right? Half of what we're getting today for something like this. But I couldn't believe how many people, we actually wanted them to go so we could convert their unit and raise it up. And we didn't think that they would pay the rent increases. They came in and said, I'll happily pay the increases for what I see you doing next door. And they stayed with the property. It was in the right location. We were next to a school. Their kids were in the school. But you were making that place a better place for those people that wanted to stay right where they were. And they were willing to pay for it. So He doesn't know I'm going to say this, but the last three months of this property, you know, every month you get a certain number of leases that come up for renewal, right? Because you sign year-long leases. So every month, uh, you know, 20, 30, whatever it is, leases come up for renewal. And a key metric we use, I talked about the metrics in the scorecards earlier, is how many of those people choose to renew? How many of those people choose to stay at the property 
usually with a rent bump, sometimes a three-figure rent bump, you know, $100, $150. The last three months, we have had over 75%, more than three-fourths of our leases that come up for renewal. They're like, I'm staying for this one, and they re-up again to stay, and, even with the rent increases. And just to give you an idea for reference, I would be surprised if the citywide average right now is 50% mm -hmm. on that yeah, number. Yeah, 75% renewal ratio on expiring leases is awesome. Yeah. Very, very good. Thank you. Okay, so remember, we want to do deals that are win-win-win for everybody. The residents won. They have a much better home to live in. We've added six new team members that are loving being a part of this change and this renovation. They, they, uh, several of them were there when we bought the property, and several have come on through the process. They've seen an incredible turnaround of this community, and they see the incredible positive impact they're being able to make. And uh, they see what it's like to be part of our company, of Veritas, and enjoy that culture. And so that's super fulfilling to have them on board. And our investors, we just talked about investors win also, making 100% returns while also making an incredible positive impact in that community and on those families living there. That is it. Do we have any questions or anything? Thank you. Yes, sir. Wait for the mic, please. Yeah. Should be. I'll repeat it. Uh, what is your long-term plan on this property? Are you going to sell it, refi, uh, hold it for cash flow? Yeah. So the question is, what is the long-term plan? What's the exit strategy on this thing? So remember, we assumed the existing loan that was in place. We didn't put a new loan on the property. That loan runs through, I think, 2026. So for now, the plan is at least for the next couple of years, we're going to keep building that value, keep building that equity. And in 2025, 2026 range, we'll kind of do a, see, hey, where, what are refinancing options looking like? What are, where's the market at if we wanted to sell and make that decision at that point? But we're just going to, it's, the cash flow is growing. The equity is growing exponentially. So we're going to ride that for another see, two, three years and then kind of make that decision and with the, the meantime, investors. in the that discount that he got for assuming that loan, that prepayment penalty is wearing down, and that's going to add to their capital gain on the back end as well. Absolutely. Great question. Anybody else? Up front. Ooh, we're dual fisting. I like it. So, like, out of the seven million that you would make in three years, you, you mentioned uh, the investors. What's the breakdown like? Is you as the owner, the investors, like, what's the breakdown? You keep what do they make? Yeah, great question. Well, you'll you'll get to learn all about that split in the two day class, and it depends on the lead investor, how many deals they've done, their experience, their track record, and then what they offered. The, I will tell you the the maximum amount allowed here is a twenty percent split to me. 80% split to the investors. And uh, that's that's the the most you could ever get. And there's no, you know, if you I don't know if you if you've ever done real estate investing outside of lifestyles, you can get plagued with fees. If you want to go invest with a guy that's gonna buy a property, he's like, Yeah, I'll take take your money. I'm only gonna I'll give you the first eight percent and you're gonna get all this money, but I might charge you a two hundred thousand dollar acquisition fee, and I'm gonna charge you a quarter million dollar loan origination fee, and I'm gonna charge you a twenty-five percent construction manager, all this stuff. We don't do any of that here. It's very clean, very cut, very or clean cut, very upfront. And so you get to, it's so easy to understand, and there's lots and lots of transparency and clarity. And different lead investors have different percentages and splits, and it just kind of depends on how experienced they are and how um, how many deals they've done. Yeah. So to fully answer your question, they we limit them to starting at five percent. So they've got to prove their worth in the beginning, and we also make them put a higher percentage of their own money in the deal, more skin in the game, but until they have to prove themselves to get to this level. And the way I look at it is a little bit different. I don't care how much money he makes. The more money he makes, the more money I make. I always say, what's in it for me? So in the bottom line, when they send out these reports of what you're going to make, it says you're going to make X amount. That's what should be important to you. What's in it for me? Does that make sense? If I put in 50 grand, we'll turn into 100 grand. That's and, right. And what he's talking about, he'll introduce you on Sunday uh, to the analysis tool that we use. And part of my job is to help you if you're investing with a John, figure out how to read it and what you're going to get out of the deal. I got a question. question up front here. I got a question online while Jacob is running. Hey, by the way, is, is, hold on for a second. Is oh, the gentleman here that uh, spoke to me today about wanting to trade me a Corvette for a deal? Where's he at? Is he still? <laughs> hey, stand, up, stand up for a second. 
Uh, this gentleman's done a bunch of deals outside of Lifestyles Unlimited. His comment was simply to me, after I saw your white paper and how your rules work, I was blown away how much safer it was to invest here than it was anywhere else, et cetera. That's paraphrasing. I hope I'm not putting dirty words in your mouth. But uh, the bottom line is, if you would, talk to him. If you're, if, and and what, what he's referring to is... I could have shot myself when I found out. Yeah, yeah. Well, the point I want to make is, before you get out of here, if you're new here and you've got that, well, this is just another place to invest. i have already doing this stuff outside in the real world. You have no idea what you're talking about. Go talk to this guy and find out how bad these other guys are ripping you off on these deals, okay? And what, and what he's talking about, we did have somebody before me, like 2005 or something like that. There was somebody that went off reservation, as we say. And we collectively put a rule book together that gets upgraded every year or two. We, we tweak something here or there. But we police ourselves, essentially, and then we put it on paper and we hand it to the people who are investing with us so that you can help police as well. And that's the rules that he's referring to. Who, who likes something that Dell came up with? Dell, Dell came up with this thing called best practices to make sure it's fair to the investors. Who likes that idea? Another thing we do here at Lifestyles and none of these other organizations out there do is we certify all our lead investors. Who likes that? They have to sit down with a mentor, make sure they understand this stuff. Then they have to sign a code of conduct, our rules. And then they have to take 34 different tests and pass every single test by 100%. Who likes that? If you get one question wrong, you have to retake the test. And then we have continuing education every single year. John, myself, Scott, even Dell must retake that every single year. That's called integrity. Give Dell a hand for coming up with that. OK. We were still up front here, right? Um, I will attest to that. We also have invested outside of here and now we're here because of the white pages but um the question i had was the expenses for all the child care or the kid after how does that come in do you charge more rent or do you actually charge them for the residents do not pay that's part that that's an expense incurred at the property and i i i guess i haven't done an exhaustive study on this but i would really expect that the that 75 percent renewal ratio that i talked about on expiring leases that has a lot to do with it. When somebody sees their kids getting poured into every day after they get home from school, you think they're going to move? Like, it's a no-brainer. And so when you, it's like Lil said, when you help enough, enough, other, enough other people get what they want, you can have whatever you want. It's about helping people and enriching others' lives. They're going to renew. It works out better for the business in the long run. Yeah, let's see them go next door looking for a little bit of rent savings and say, okay, now that you've showed me your pool and your grilling area, what about your child care program? <laughs> huh? Our child education program. Good question. Anybody else? Yeah, was this complex charging for utilities or all bills paid? And is your follow up, as a follow up, does your plan include rubs? Re yeah, good question. So, in, in the multifamily world, you have your rent that's charged to the residents, and then there's the utility expenses. And there's several ways to handle that. You can either allocate the utility costs and bill a portion of that back to the residents and it changes every month and they have to kind of pay a different price every month or another simpler structure is what has been historically called all bills paid that kind of has a dirty word we call it utilities package now but a uh, um but your and that's just a flat rate that gets charged to the residents of two three hundred dollars whatever it is and then it includes all their utilities so to answer the question we inherited it a system where they were allocating it they weren't doing it right Technically, it wasn't quite legal. It was shady. And so now we offer both options. So we say, hey, if you want to move in and you have the credit and everything to get your own utilities turned on in your name and you want to handle that, go for it. Knock yourself out. If that would be difficult for you, here's a utilities included option for you that is the base rent plus a premium. And, and that's not something we're like taking advantage of the residents on. It's something where they don't have to handle any inconveniences of getting everything turned on in their name or worried about spiking prices in the summer and dropping ones in the winter. We make 25 bucks or so a month on that package if they choose to take that and it's a win-win for everybody. Yeah, when I've done that in the past, I found that I make money in the winter and I kind of break even or maybe lose a little in August. That's how you, that's how you figure out how much to charge. I should yeah. break even in the summer and make money in the winter. Yeah. <laughs> Great question. We have one over here. Approximately how many uh, people were, were in this deal and what was the minimum? 
Great so question. the question was how many investors and what was the minimum on this deal? Yeah, um, there are, I would say, let me back up. In the lifestyles community of deals done, especially if it's a, a lead that maybe has only done one or two deals, you can usually get into in a deal for some. There's some people that will take twenty-five thousand. A lot of minimums are fifty thousand, and then it, most people will, um, who have done several deals and have a long track record, maybe that minimum is a hundred thousand. Um, the last couple deals that I personally have done, and I am the outlier here. This is not normal. My personal minimum on, on some on my more recent deals is two hundred thousand, and I find that. Um, by, that just lowers the number of investors in my deals. And again, this is not representative of the mo most other leads. This is just my kind of personal decision. Honestly, it just simplifies my life. It's fewer investors in a deal. It's fewer K-1s to process. People, um, you know, I, I, usually people I, I know more closely because they're all pr previous investors for the most part. And so on this specific deal, the minimum was 200,000. I think I have like 12 investors or something like that. But I have other deals with a lower minimum that I have 75 investors on that deal. And many other leads do, well, like I said, will do 25,000, 50,000 investments, and they maybe have over 100 investors. So there's lots and lots of different options to fit. Every, you have every to keep lead. in mind, too, that as he said earlier in his presentation, he's been doing it approximately one deal every two years. Well, I've been in that program before when I had kids in the house and I was coaching Little League and soccer and all that, and I was on that kind of a time scale. It also seemed to coordinate with when I was doing a refi or a sale of a property, and I had a lot of people that I had a history with that suddenly had a boatload of money they were trying to reinvest, so they were saying, please take my money back and put it in another deal. John, what, what would you say your retention is on investors? Like, if you doubled their money in this deal, how many of them would go to your next deal? Um, almost all of them. See, so so the, that kind of answers I have, that. I have, I have almost all repeat investors uh, deal, deal, deal after deal. This particular deal, I think I sent like maybe two emails, and in a week or two, I had the money raised. You know, there's the track record. Right and now. I will tell you that that started to be a problem when we were much smaller before we learned what the internet was and lifestyles really grew. Now, to for you to get in a deal in Arizona and a different deal in Florida and a different deal somewhere else is really easy to do because of a system that we've put in place as we've grown. And really, I have to say that COVID and the whole lockdown situation forced a lot of this technology on us. And it was really for a good thing now that it's all said and done. Yeah. Again, I'm, the, I'm, the biggest thing we find here at Lifestyles for people that want to invest in deals is everybody who joins up is so worried, can I get in my first deal? Within six months, they ran out of money every single time. How, how many people in this room that are already investing in apartment deals ran out of money? See, look at that. You probably have 50 hands up. So They're that's why we're here. refi so they can do their next deal. Up front here. Thank you so much for your presentation. Are the deals, do they both include 506B and 506C offerings or are they 506B only for non-accredited or are they a mixture of accredited and non-accredited? Have you been to the seminar before? Yeah, you're throwing around some terms there. Yeah, that, that, yeah. that's good. Uh, to answer your question, so this is really advanced. The way most deals are structured, you can have a certain number of what he what's what's uh, what's called non-accredited or what's the word sophisticated. sophisticated. Thank you. Right. Sophisticated investors, and then an unlimited amount of accredited investors. And you'll learn all about that in the two day. It's just has has to do with kind of how experienced of an investor you are. This particular deal. Because of that high minimum I talked about, I think I had, I'm pretty sure I had all accredited investors, but that is abnormal. I said, this is kind of an anomaly. Yeah. Most deals done here have a mix of accredited and non-accredited right. investors. We want, Dell wanted it so that the regular person, the, the police officer, the truck driver, they could get involved as well. So we do allow what's called sophisticated investors. And I'll teach what that means during the seminar. You don't need to worry about all that now. The point is, is regular folks like yourselves can do this. Does it take money to invest? Yeah, you're going to need 70, 100 grand for this to make sense for you. But if you don't have that kind of money to apartments, what do you do? Where do we start? Houses, 25, 30 grand, you can buy houses and then move up to that. That's where he started. Wealth, wealth peering is a, is a series of steps, wealth building. Hey, guys, <clears throat> just, just for your knowledge, when someone is trying to do something that's outside of the white paper or is in my mind, dangerous, I require them to get or to take only accredited investors, people, you know, that have the money, understand the business, and can afford to take the loss. Do you follow me? So if you ever see somebody that's using only accredited investors, it's because I made them nine times out of ten, 
do it that way or I wouldn't let him raise the money here, you know, because it's too risky for beginners to run into that. That kind of a deal I thought was too risky for beginners and we, they haven't been trained on it. They shouldn't be in it. Does that make sense? Now, outside of here, they can do whatever the hell they want to do. But in here, I want people that, that uh, to get into the deals in the safest possible manner. So most of the deals allow for sophisticated and accredited investors. If it's, there's a guardrail. As a matter of fact, the guardrails Life Sauce provides, you're not going to run off the track. <laughs> you know, my bound deal do this a little bit, but you're not going to run off the track. Cool. What else? Anything else? Good questions. Anything online? We're good. Now, did your apartment insurance get higher with the after school program? And were there any <laughs> Section 8 tenants in the complex? Man, we're getting detail. I like it. So, question is and y'all heard it. With all that running the after school program, of course, it's like, oh, shoot, what about insurance? Uh, we had to dance around a little bit with our insurance company and assure that we use. The, the key thing is for that after school program, there's a third party ministry that we bring in to run that whole thing. That's not my employee running that. It's a third party ministry that has their own insurance. I'm listed as additional insured. You know, we share in the cost of running it. Um, and it's, we're, it's a fantastic relationship. And so I was able to keep property insurance. And once my, once my insurance company found out that we were listed as additional insured on the third party's insurance policy, we're good. And then uh, the other question was, so do you take Section 8? Section 8 is a housing voucher program that people can um, go through the housing authority and it pays a portion of their rent. There's a lot of strings attached with taking government-funded rent. Some properties take it and like it. I've chosen not to do that. It's a, it's, um, it, it requires an incredible administrative burden to comply with the um, requirements of that program, and I'm not making my staff go through that. So we do not take Section 8 uh, renters at any of our properties. Yeah, and just to add to that, if you're taking low income, doing low income housing or something like that, Section 8, a lot of the groups that specialize in that, they have a whole department at corporate to make sure that they're meeting all the parameters inside of that. So it's not something where you want to. It, it requires, do it, on the side. it just about requires a full time person yeah. for the compliance alone. Just sad. I hate it. It's like I would love to participate, but it's just too much. It doesn't make any business sense. Cool. What else? Yes, in the back. Thank you for the great uh, presentation, great info. Uh, quick question about um, short-term arbitrage. Are you concerned about that, or what are your thoughts? You know, you're president of you know, the Houston Apartment Association. Is that a concern for folks who you know, do like an arbitrage, short-term Airbnb kind of, that kind of stuff? Oh, like a short-term rental situation? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not super worried about short-term rentals at this particular property in Pasadena. There are <laughs> other areas. We don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so to answer your question, at, at my property, we don't, we, don't, we don't do that at our level. We, we toyed with it at one property, and it was fine. It was a lot of work. It was just outside of our normal scope of how we do things. There are other companies that have decided we're going to go all in on this, and we're going to try to get a piece of that pie and run this short-term rental Airbnb business. Um, in my experience, when we kind of toyed with it, it made some money, but it was just a completely different business model, and it wasn't worth you – know, this is working really well. So let's not try to like go off to chase after this shiny thing. We're going to stick to our lane. And Can I ask you why you asked well. that question, yeah. just out of curiosity? <laughs> That's a good point. Why did you ask that question? Uh, because I own two Airbnbs, and uh, I'm kind of torn. Kind of like I'm, I'm, I signed up for the two-day um, seminar, and um, I joined the two-day seminar with David probably four or five months ago. So I keep going back and forth. The cash flow with the Airbnb is pretty good. But like, I'm worried about regulation and how sustainable that is. So my, my prediction from what I've seen, just watching what's going on nationally, is they're going to eliminate Airbnbs. The hotel industry is going to crush it. They do not like it, and they're doing everything to do to get rid of it. And in liberal states, it will be gone. They will eliminate it completely. Uh, then you've got uh, the other situation is, is that you've got cities that don't like it and communities that don't like it. So in other words, it's a business that pisses off just about everybody it touches. And for that reason alone, um, there's concern for that business, right? But the other reason is the cash flow situation is really good, is what you're saying, right? So you, you're, you're playing for cash flow. There's a lot of businesses in this world that have very high cash flow, but have 
other problems and you know associated with them. And the reason the cash flow is so high is because of the other problems. And since I don't want to take up any more of these great guys' conversation here, I'll just tell you, you need to talk outside of here, just networking why what other problems are associated with it, because that's why you're getting high cash flows. That makes sense. In any any situation where they're paying you abnormal cash flow to get the same product, there's got to be some reason. Does that make sense? I'll, right. I'll tell you. you and too. remember one further thing. We screen our residents. No felons, no sex offenders. Airbnb? Yeah, so the, actually if the place you're adding with you're, other residents, so. If the place where you're renting from is using the Texas Apartment Association lease, there is actually verbiage in that lease that basically says no Airbnb without saying it. There are restrictions and actions inside of there that some people will turn the other way and let you into their class A and let you run that room as a hotel room. But if they wanted to say, whoops, we just found out you're airbnb it, read your lease, you're out. They can do that as well. Question. Right. We're good. All right, let's, let's give these two guys a hand.